But we realized, you know, there's an, A, there's no gathering for people like us. It's like bootstrap software people. So it's startups, but it's not Silicon Valley. And, and we're, not, we're not trying to go public. We're just trying to have these epic lifestyle businesses. You know, you want to build a six or a seven figure software company and build a great lifestyle. And that was MicroConf. It was like, let's get people in a room. Can we even do that? You know, and the first year was rough. It was really hard selling tickets. There was no brand name. It was hard to get speakers. You know, I mean, I was pulling in all the favors from, you know, everybody that I had <laughs> ever done favors for. It was amazing. It was so you such a unique event because I had never been to an event where everyone around you understood what you did. Yeah, the second year sold out in two weeks. Third year sold out in 24 hours. Fourth wow. year sold out in three minutes, literally three minutes. We stand today. The business method the business with method. the shadow. The business method. The business method podcast. The business method podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneur systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that have built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that produce over a million dollars in annual revenue. And now we're interviewing 100 major influencers to get behind the minds and the science of using influence to grow business and influence income results, economies, and cultures. There's a growing number of people building these caliber of businesses like this, and we're going to figure out what it takes to make this happen now let's jump in today's show the business method many influencers use a conference as an incredible opportunity to build camaraderie with their community a lot of times it is this event that can really take a person's influence to the next level people need this type of event to build a tribe and to create personal one-on-one -on -one connections today's guest is no different rob wallain is the founder of microconf the first conference for software and SaaS entrepreneurs and enthusiasts today microconf is known worldwide and it has two major events in the U.S. and one in Europe. Rob hops on the mic to chat about building MicroConf to what it is today, the tools and methods he used to start his first event and building it to where it literally sells out now in three minutes. On top of running MicroConf, Rob is a successful serial entrepreneur, blogger, the founder of Drip, Tiny Seed, Zen Founder Podcast, and Startups for the Rest of Us Podcast. Chatting with Rob was a great pleasure, and without further ado, you guys, let's welcome the founder of MicroConf, Rob Walling, to the show. Entrepreneur systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, I want to welcome Rob Walling to the podcast from the Sunshine State of Minnesota. Rob, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I think the feels like is nine degrees Fahrenheit today. <laughs> it's snowing up there already, right? No, barely no. any. Yeah, no. which is which is nice. Yeah, it's good. Well, thanks for joining. And we were introduced from a fellow co-creator, I guess, of MicroConf Europe or a friend or a partner of that original events dan taylor who has also been a guest on the show and noah's on the mic joining us today too hello hello <laughs> and um so we're glad to have you on the show i have heard about microcomp for the past few years and i know people have the good friends that have flown halfway across the world to go to microcomp in las vegas and they say amazing things about it and friends actually that have spoken at your event too uh chris gimmer is a good friend and um, have heard good things about it. And so as we're interviewing these influencers and growing as influencers our, ourselves, um, I thought you would be a perfect match to have on the show. So thank you for joining us. And we just kind of want to give you the mic, 
Rob, for a couple minutes to kind of figure out how you became the entrepreneur that you are today. I know you got uh, quite a, a resume of history. We start with startups, um, ones that you're working on now, ones that you've worked on in the past, helping other startups and other companies, uh, software companies, um, grow as businesses and grow as entrepreneurs. So, so if you don't mind, Rob, I'd just like to to figure out how you became the amazing entrepreneur that you are today. Sure. And, you know, thanks for having me on the show, guys. It's a pleasure, pleasure to be here. It's funny that the longer, um, the longer your career gets, the longer the, the more things that you have to either cut out or, or make your intro longer. So I'll, I'll try to keep it brief, but I was uh, a professional, I became a software developer in 1999, 2000. It's when after I came out of uh, college and I was really unhappy with you know, working for other people and knew that I wanted to do some type of, of thing on the side. But back then there was no, you know, business method podcast. There was no microconf or dynamite circle. And I was just looking for how can I, how can I work for myself? What does that even look like? And I looked around at Silicon Valley. So I grew up in, in the Bay area in, in the Silicon Valley. And that was a model that I thought you had to do, especially given that I was writing software. And so to me, it was like, well, you have to raise funding and you have to come up with these big ideas and you know, do all this crazy stuff and bet the farm and 90 hour weeks and all that. And I never even t attempted to raise funding. I was too intimidated by it, but I did launch a number of pieces of software, tried to, tried to make them startups, but they were just, they were really bad ideas over about the course of about five years. And it wasn't until 2005, so about 13 years ago that I had my first success. Uh, and it was with a little piece of software uh, that did invoicing. And it was just a couple thousand dollars a month, but it was side income. I barely was doing any work for it. And I realized I don't need one startup to make me millions. I don't need one startup to even make me 120K, which is kind of what I was looking for to, to live on. I made more than that as a consultant, but you know, I could live on about 100, 120K. And this piece of software was doing, you know, 25 grand a year and I, I couldn't grow it, couldn't grow it. And I thought, what if I had just a couple more businesses that were similar to this, that were doing 25K? I don't need that many to stack to make this, this goal of 100K. And so I looked around um, for any business that I could acquire and I moved into the acquisition pretty quickly or the acquisition mode because I was making a lot of, I had more, more money than time. So I was making a lot of money as a consultant. I had a small child, we had a house. And I was trying to figure out how can I get there faster? You know, how can I get, instead of building these things all myself, if I can buy something for, you know, 20 grand and improve it and then, you know, have it making, you know, five grand a month or whatever, I, I don't need that many of those to, to be able to quit consulting. And so over the course of, you know, four years ish, I built a couple, but I acquired several more and I, I did software products. I had a uh, small SaaS, which wasn't called SaaS at the time, of course. I had an e-commerce mm -hmm, website mm -hmm. that sold beach towels. I had two, three different eBooks, one on bonsai trees, one on, I can't remember what the other one was, you know, just ran completely random across all these niches. And I learned a ton from that. And I started blogging about it. And that was, that really kicked me into this mode of, wow, I can just share what I'm learning and it, it helps other people who were just a little bit behind me. You know, maybe they're six months or a year behind. But that started building my my brand and my influence. Excellent. And and so we'll get into the nitty gritty of, of the businesses that you've built. But here's one pending question that kind of resonates uh, on my mind that I've heard a lot. So I'm a marketing guy, right? I'm a marketing and a sales guy. And I built... Uh, my business is using that as my strength. Now, I have a lot of friends that do have SaaS businesses, software as a service business, um, and tech businesses. And it's a, a little bit off talk, topic, but I want to ask you, and I think you'd be the person to answer this. What is the importance of knowing and understanding and creating the behind the scenes um, code? and structure of a good either SaaS business uh, and website because I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, put it up there, market it, go go with marketing, make sales, da 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 right? But all my friends are like, no, you've got to make sure that code and the SaaS and everything else is running really securely 
behind the scenes or else it all could go to shit. Right. right? That's so right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so what would be your answer to that? Yeah. If, if marketing were my strong suit and I was trying to get started today, I would not, I would not do software. I know that it, it, it is the Holy grail because it's recurring revenue and man, once you build it up, it's amazing. And the valuations, if you want to exit are huge, you know, there's all these amazing things, but to me, it's the major leagues and you don't come out as a 12 year old and, and play in the major leagues. You play little league and then you move up to, you know, to high school and then you do college and then you do single A, double A, triple A. I did all of that. I was, I was the teenager, you know, the 12 year old back in 2005 and I knew how to do software. I didn't know shit about marketing. And so what did I do? I got this little app, tiny little dot net invoice, and it was doing a few hundred dollars a month. And I learned SEO and I learned AdWords and I screwed up content marketing and I did display advertising very poorly, you know, but, but I tried all these things and I learned that I was pretty good. I, since I have the engineering mindset, I learned that I was good at SEO and AdWords and I doubled down on those with dot net invoice. And then as I bought and built new things, I was just, I had two hammers you know, and everything looked like a nail when I had two hammers. It was SEO and AdWords. And I knew that if I could buy something and crank the SEO and the AdWords up, that I could make it set successful. So all that to say, if marketing had been my thing from the start, I would have done the eBooks, the e-commerce, the, um, the info products, you know, that, that's where I would start. And it, in the true form of like stair-stepping up and like getting some small wins, getting some experience, getting some income, and some money and some confidence, I would start there. And if you want to move to SaaS eventually, that's fine. SaaS is hard. It's a lot harder than, than people think. I'm even seeing successful info marketers who are doing, you know, have six or seven figure info businesses struggle with SaaS, struggle with yeah, software, yeah. period, you know, even WordPress plugins, but, but really struggle with SaaS because it's a, I mean, there is people, it's, it's an engineering discipline, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, no, I've run, I, so one of my apps was called Hittail and it was a, a small SaaS app. It was almost like a, a single feature. You know, it wasn't even a complicated SaaS app. And that was one that a marketer could have just taken to town. It was one of the exceptions. So there are some around, but just trying to go in and build something from scratch these days, if you don't know software, it's, it's pretty unlikely that, that you're going to do well in the long run. You might get something out. You might get a V1 built, but you're going to have to rewrite that once you hit any type of scale. And it's going to be really painful when you do. Noah, do you have any software businesses? No, I did. Uh, I used to have a VPN company, a virtual private network, but that was uh, a while ago, and then I sold it because oh, indeed it's 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 uh, it's very like the competition, like the people that that run SaaS are all super bright and and high standard people. So like the competition is very high. Yeah, I agree. And and for me, when I hear people talking about software and SaaS, a lot of times it almost seems like they're talking another language. They're speaking another language because it's on another level. And I, I really admire that because it is another language in, in so many different respects. But at the same time, like these businesses that they're creating, these entrepreneurs are creating these software businesses and just a few short years, a lot of times selling them or having an incredible amount of passive income online and working really, really, really few hours. And I'm sure, uh, Rob, you've probably, I'm sure you've dealt with dozens of those people, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's my whole yeah. community, you know, the microconf crowd and yeah. podcast audience is, is essentially that. Yeah. What was the very first uh, business that you started? It w Well, the the first one that, that actually made some money was .NET Invoice. And I acquired it when it was in alpha. So it was not, the code wasn't complete. It was buggy as hell. They had some alpha testers, customers who had, they had charged and the customers were all pissed off, but I didn't know that when I acquired it. <laughs> um, and like I said, it was doing 200, 300 bucks a month. And um, I grew it up to about, well, at its peak, it was doing between three and 4,000 a month, but it averaged like maybe 2,500 a month for years, for like five, six years with not a ton of, of work. And then what'd you grow into after that, the other businesses? Yeah, I acquired, you know, the beginner bonsai, which was bonsai trees. And that, that was a little micro thing that was purely an SEO play, right? It, it just ranked in the first page of Google for, you know, I don't know, learn bonsai or something. And um, I grew it up to 500 a month. And oh, I had one, a DIY duck boat, which was um, duck plans for making a duck boat out of, it had like a shopping list, like a Home Depot shopping list. And then 
videos and all kinds of stuff. So it was just an info product. And that one, again, was an, it was an SEO play. Um, so I had a bunch like that. And then I sold, like I said, I sold beach towels. They, you know, it was drop shipped from this company and never made a ton of, I had about two grand a month in revenue from the beach towels one. Um, but the margins suck right on, on drop shipping. So I barely made any money. And I was like, you know, I'm making so much more money from software and I'm experienced, you know, and I know how to do this. Why don't I dive more into that? And so really my next stair step up, um, after I, after I launched MicroConf and, and the podcast, which is Startups for the Rest of Us, where I continued to talk about this stuff. My next stair step up was into um, a, a, a SaaS app called Hittail, and it's hittail.com. Uh, I acquired that as well from uh, a P, essentially a PR firm, a woman who had run a PR firm. They had started Hittail in you know, 2006, and it was built on kind of older technology, and it was, it was failing. It wasn't really being maintained. Um, and it had just a tiny bit of revenue, like 1500 a month maybe, but the expenses were about 1500 a month because it was, it was co-located in a, in a cage, you know, the, the, it had physical servers. I'll put it that way. They were, they were paying rent, you know, in a data center in, in New York. And, um, I acquired it uh, for $30,000, which was a huge gamble for me. I was super stressed. It was like all, almost all the money I'd saved uh, from the <laughs> other businesses. I was very stressed about it, but then I, I, that was a game changer for me. It was a life changing, uh, you know, couple years there. And that one I got, I eventually got it up to about 25 or 30 grand a month um, with almost, you know, with barely any expenses. So it was, it was that moment where it was like, oh, I'm going from being a, you know, I had a comfortable life in California, uh, you know, I'm making 120 to 150 K from these basically a lot of passive in, income businesses. Um, I was working, you know, 10, 15 hours a week. I had a brand new baby, it's my, our second kid, and I hung out with him, and it was great. And then I kind of got bored, in all honesty. The four-hour work week, it's boring, you know, after a while. <laughs> and uh, that's when I, you know, bought Hittail and, and grew it, and that was where it was like, oh, man, this is what, this is what we can do as entrepreneurs, you know, have that life-changing uh, life income. Uh, so around what, what timeline is this? What year was that? Uh, that was, Hittail was, I acquired it in uh, 2011, and then revamped it over 2012, and it hit its peak in 2013. Panda and Penguin caused it a bunch of issues, and um, it still, you know, continued to be successful for me. But I did once I started Drip, which was my kind of my swan song <laughs> SaaS app. Uh, my most recent one I did, I sold Hittail in 2015. And and then you started MicroConf in 2011, correct? That's right. Yep. And, and what was the motivation for for MicroConf? So for the listeners, MicroConf is uh, you you is this the tagline? Largest conference for bootstrap startups? Something like that. Yeah. Largest, most popular, most respected. I don't know. It's something. It's just the one in the field that's been around forever, and and we sell out every year. And uh, I feel like it has a, it. It's cool when people come to microconf this started happening maybe three four years ago and i introduced myself i said rob walling and they say cool what do you do and i'm like <laughs> that was it that was the moment where microconf became a brand you know and it's no longer about myself and my podcast co-host mike mike Tabor. uh we started uh, a podcast called startups for the rest of us in 2010 and we had an online uh community much you know similar to dynamite circle um, and it's, it's currently today, it's called founder cafe. I had a different name back then, but we realized, you know, there's an, a, there's no gathering for people like us. It's like bootstrap software people. So it's startups, but it's not Silicon Valley. And, and we're not, we're not trying to go public. We're just trying to have these epic lifestyle businesses. You know, you want to build a six or a seven figure, uh, you know, annual revenue software company and build a great lifestyle, whether you're able to travel, whether you stay where you are and, you know, just, just have a good life. And that was microconf. It was like, let's get people in a room. Can we even do that? You know, and the first year was rough. It was really hard selling tickets. There was no brand name. It was hard to get speakers. You know, I mean, I was pulling in all the favors from, you know, everybody that I had <laughs> ever done favors for. Um, but we sold about, I don't know, 90 tickets maybe. <clears throat> Excuse me. We sold about 90 tickets and you know, basically filled a room with speakers and sponsors. We had 120 people, which is plenty to have an uh, interesting conference. And it was so, 
it was amazing. It was so you such a unique event because I had never been to an event where everyone around you understood what you did, you know, because yeah. I, I, I'm sure like you guys in your everyday life, you walk around, you have friends, you have family, you have people you hang out, you know, happy hour with and nobody understands what you do. Yeah. And this, this was the time when it was like, man, this is life changing for us. And so that was it. And microconf got more and more momentum over the years um, until it, you know, it, it used to sell out before we expanded it. I mean, it was selling out by the time the inbox was, the emails were hitting people's inbox, it was selling out. So it was selling out in like three minutes and people were getting really wow. angry, which is a good problem to have, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, of course. We, we basically had to expand it and without trying, you know, we tried not to uh, try not to dilute it. You don't just want to make a 500 person event, right? You lose the, you lose the intimacies. Yeah. Of course. And now you have microconf starter edition, microconf growth edition and microconf Europe. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. And so growth and starter are typically in March or April. Um, and they're in Las Vegas. And, you know, I've, th we describe starter as from it's with people who, you know, are from idea to full-time income, right? Full-time living, which tends to be, if you're in the States, you know, 8K a month, 10K a month. And then growth is for, you know, low six figures to seven and, and low eight figures. And those are in March, actually, March 26th through the 29th, I believe, of next year. So if this does sound interesting and you're, you know, you're listening to this, microconf.com is, is where you can find more info about that. Can you share like with us the, your experience? How did you, uh, when you started microconf, how did you get it, let's say, that, that people uh, go to there? Like what were the, I mean, it's never one defining factor, but usually it's one thing that makes 80% of the success. Yeah. You mean, how did we sell tickets that first year? Yeah. Sell tickets, yeah. Get, get speakers. Like, uh, yeah. um, usually yeah, like if, if it's very difficult to start something like that. And, and I think a lot of listeners and a lot of people, they under, uh, estimate the power, energy and the time and efforts that goes into organizing a conference. Yeah, I would agree. It was way more work than we thought. So here's the reason we were able to pull it off is that we had an audience if we had not had, and we had some type of reputation. I mean, it was still early, but it would have been, it would not, we would have shut it down if we had not had the podcast audience, our email lists, we had blogs. I mean, I still have a blog, but it's just, I don't really write much on it anymore. Um, that is what made the, the biggest difference. When we launched MicroConf, we, what do we do? We, we talked to a hotel in Vegas and we said, what dates do you have? Everybody was too expensive for us, all the hotels. So we went to a really cheap one called the Riviera. It doesn't even exist anymore. It was the last few years it existed. So it was old. But, you know, they said, well, with a commitment of, minimum commitment of 20,000 bucks, you know, these dates are open. And we're like, okay, put mm -hmm. those on hold and let us know. Like, we're not going to sign, but like, let us know if anyone else tries to grab those dates. So we had these dates and we didn't, you know, we didn't have to sign anything. And so we, I went and, and I emailed people that I knew. And I emailed Andrew Warner from Mixergy. I emailed Patrick McKenzie, you know, um, Patio 11. I emailed Sean Ellis and just a few other people who I'd crossed paths with. And I said, hey, would you be willing? Oh, and Heaton Shaw, right? He's a startup guy in Silicon Valley. Started Kissmetrics and Crazy Egg. And I said, I have, we're going to have this conference. It's for self-funded startups. You know, it's for us. Would you speak? And I got those guys to say, yes, this sounds great. So then I went and built a landing page and I put it up and I put it up with my name and Mike's and the other speakers. And I said, we're throwing this event and we posted it to Hacker News. We emailed our list. We, you know, we did all the things. And, you know, again, we weren't, we weren't selling tickets. We didn't even have event space yet. And it was truly a smoke test of like, can we get enough people interested in this? I believe we got, I'm trying to remember how many, it was between 300 and 500 email addresses to that page. And then we said, all right, that's enough. We're gonna, I think we can sell tickets. So then we went and we booked the space and started finding other speakers. And I went all out that year. I mean, I ever, we had Ramit Sethi, we had Noah Kagan, we had, it, I just kept trying to stack that with like the speakers the first year were the draw. The speakers are yeah. no longer the draw. We don't even announce speakers until all the tickets are sold typically this uh, at this point because you know, the microcomp brand name has it. So, so that was it. Um, it was certainly an adventure. We didn't sell nearly as many as we wanted. I mean, we wanted a 225 person event and we wound up with about 115, 120, but we did make a little money that first year and breaking even was the goal. 
Um, but yeah, man, it was a ton of work, a ton of work. I was spending 20 hours a week on it at the time, just trying to promote it and sell tickets and stuff. Yeah, we made, I think we made like five or 10 grand that year. And it was, you know, hundreds of hours of work. Now it's the opposite, right? We, make, we get sponsors, we have all this stuff. So we make a, a, a nice little chunk of money and my total time investment, because we, we pay a coordinator to do almost all that now. So emails are going out like this week and I'm not, I'm not doing any of it. Um, so now, aside from the time being on site, you know, maybe Mike and I spend 20 hours, you know, finding speakers and, you know, the whole time, like the whole conference, finding speakers and sponsors. When would you say, Rob, was the tipping point for the brand Microcomp? So it seems like you had success in year one, more or less, putting on a good event and selling 90 tickets. When would you say, when did you think like, oh, okay, we we have something here. And then when do you think it kind of took off and what made it take off? Yeah, the second year sold out in two weeks third year sold out in 24 hours fourth wow. year sold out in three minutes literally three minutes um wow and so that <laughs> that was so that was 12 2012 2013 2014 um it took off and the, i believe there were a couple things that i think really catalyzed it number one we we got really good speakers and we got really good videos made of them and we gave them all away for free and so you can still go back and, you know, you'll go to our website or you just go to Vimeo and search for microconf and you can see some amazing, amazing talks from Jason Cohen and Heaton Shaw, Dan Martell, you know, people who, even at the time, a Joanna Weeb, like 2011, 2012, 2013, a lot of these folks, I say the names now and they might resonate with your audience or they might not, but they're, these are well-known, like big name players who you would be hard press to get to your conference today yeah. but back then we were all kind of up and comers you know jason cohen less so to be honest but there were we were all kind of up and coming and like building our personal brands together you know we didn't re realize it but it was like hey yeah let's let's do this so i think we i think we got a little lucky there but we also we hustled and you know we uh we networked and got the good speakers i think mike and i also really really cared about the event and we still do and we've built it as a community not as we're not event people we're community people you know like i, I build software companies so i'm not going to run an event business and milk it for every dollar that that it can generate and you there, there's a difference in feel like i'm part of the community and i think that that that's a big deal you know you can feel it when you go to conferences that are run by people who are not part of the community um, so I think there's, there's something there. We basically build the conference we want to attend just like, you know, Dan and Ian do it with DCBKK and, uh, uh, Chris Yates does it with Rhodium. Like the, those are the best events that I know about. And it's, I think that's something, it's something about the founders being, having the love for, you know, the, the people around them and, and for the event. I totally Sorry, that was, agree. That was a bit yeah. of a rant, but <laughs> I kind of got out there. Great. So yeah, no, I think those were the the big reasons. It was just caring a lot about it, and word of mouth was insane, right? I mean, our our returning attendee rate it was and is still sixty or seventy percent. Wow. So we get a lot of returning attendees, and then they tell they tell other people. So even now, we have folks who come every other year, which I think is a not a bad plan. You know, they say I'm going to come every other year, but we have enough of those that, you know, we we're still able to sell it out. So it's a ton of work like anything else, right? It's like building a, building a business is a lot of work up front. And then hopefully you can get to the point where it's a little more, you know, becomes a little more of its own brand. So like the, when, when you started this, the, the conferences, if, if someone would like want to start now also a conference, I think the, the world of conferences is booming and there is like, almost literally a conference for every niche and for every niche within a niche. Um, and it's becoming like easier in my appear, like uh, how I see it, it's becoming easier to start a conference because it's much easier also to, to, uh, uh, to connect with a tribe or with a niche. Well, what, what is like if someone, if one of the audience's persons is looking to start a, a, a conference, uh, w what are the tips and tricks that you would, advise them before starting yeah that's a good point and i agree with you noah that i think it is easier to start a conference today or an in-person event than it was five or six years ago seven or eight years ago for that matter um if i were to try to start one today and i do think there's still opportunity in niches i think there are untapped 
segments where a, a conference could could function. If I were to start one today, I might start it as a meet on meetup.com to get some experience running an event because in the beginning, you're not going to have the money to pay anybody. So you're going to be doing all the logistics yourself. And I might either try to do a, a monthly gathering if I lived in a city big enough to support that, or maybe try to do a, um, you know, a one day regional event. And by regional, I mean, you do a low ticket price, you get regional speakers who can either drive or nonstop flight in, you know, with cheap flights. And then the attendees mostly are driving in from there. There's not going to be a ton who, who fly in from other areas. And I've seen this done. I saw some lean startup events done like this up in Vancouver and in Oregon. And it's, it's one day so that, again, people drive in. They don't have to stay at a hotel. You can charge, you know, between 99 and let's say 299 Depends on the value and all that, that you're providing. That's $99 and, and $299. And try to break even. That's what I would do. Um, before, now, here's the thing. That's if you're going to dive straight into the event. I, personally, I would try to build some kind of audience and, and either connect with the tribe or build my own. And that would, either, that would be whatever your strength is. Are you a really good writer? Well, then, then go blog your ass off and promote that. Are you a, a good, you know, good verbally? Then start your podcast. You know, are you good on video? Are you a good public speaker? Are you, you, know, there's, are you really good on social media? Then you know, it's going to be Twitter, Instagram, you know, Indie Hackers, Hacker News, DC, you know, Founder Cafe, whatever. And build up, show that you give value to people. Show that you're smart. Show that you're motivated. And if people resonate with that, then you get them on an email list. Hey, you want to hear more from me? Come to robwalling.com. You know, that kind of stuff and sign up for my email. And that now, hey, boy, I have 500 people or 1,000 people who kind of listen to what I say, right? And, and if you're opinionated and, and you have, you know, um, you've picked a niche basically, then that's, that's the easiest way, right? Is even with 1,000 people on an email list, I bet you could sell, you know, 50 tickets to some, some small event if you you know, kind of geolocated where everybody's at and, and came to them. Yeah, you, you make a, a good point about building the audience because I've recognized this in my own journey because we've done events for the past four years too, um, that, you know, if you're going out there, quote unquote, naked and not having an audience and starting events, it's really, 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 really hard to create the event and attract the people, then to promote the events, then to get make sure you're getting the right people, then do all the logistics for the event before you have that audience. But a lot of times, like having that audience beforehand, you can just say, hey, audience, we're going here. I like the way I'm setting it up like this and whoever wants to come can come and then almost not instantly, but um, pretty e much more easily uh, the people will come. So I think you mentioned, Rob, that blogging played a huge role for you to create your tribe beforehand. How did that all play out? Yeah. So I started the blog in 2005 and I was just talking about like software development and software project management because that was my world. I worked for, you know, as a contractor and full time as different times for big companies. And so I was kind of talking about what I was interested in and what I knew about what I had things to say about and opinions about. And as I got into these, these side hustles, I got really interested in them and what I was learning. And I started blogging about them. I really kind of pivoted the blog in, let's say 2006, 2007, started blogging more and more about Hey, I'm, I'm making, I, I didn't say how much I was making. Cause that was, I just always felt like that was kind of weird, but I talked about, Hey, uh, I acquired this product and I have one called uh, like a blog series. It was my first real um, hit in the entrepreneurial space. And it was called the inside story of a small software acquisition. And at the, again, at the time, no one, it's like, that can happen. No one acquired software when you were just a person, you know, working a day job like that is crazy. And so I did this three part series. And it, I think all three parts went to the front page of, of Hacker News and uh, Dig, I think and back at the time, you know, back in the day, this was Dig. And that was the social media, right? There really wasn't Twitter and that around it yet. And so I got a ton of interest from there. And I realized I'm going to talk more about this. So yeah, so I built up a following, you know, one RSS subscriber at a time up, up until I had about 25,000 RSS <laughs> subscribers in, uh, in 2010, 2011 and really parlayed that 
into an email list, right? About the, I started doing email marketing in let's say 2006, 2007, and that became a big thing of, I was like, oh my gosh, no one is doing this. Like no one's doing email marketing well. And so you don't even have to be that good at it, you know, to, to <laughs> get, get the dividends. And so as I would acquire these businesses, boom, start an email list, you know, <laughs> up the conversion rates by 30%. I mean, it was, it was crazy. And so then I started blogging about that. And I use that email list to then, I self-published a book called Start Small, Stay Small, A Developer's Guide to Launching a Startup. And that became its own flywheel, both for my personal brand and reputation. Um, but also, I expected to make a few thousand dollars from it. And it sold 11,000 copies. I've made like a quarter million dollars from self-publishing this book, which I genuinely wow. Was, wow. was not my intention. It was not, you know, and I mean, good, good problems to have, right? But it was, yeah. That's it the was best not, not it is. Yeah. That's right. I, I, when I wrote the book, I said, if I make 10 grand from this book, I will, I will consider my time paid for, you know, <laughs> and it was just one of those that hit at the right time in, an, in the right niche. It was opinionated. You know, if you go read it, it's from, it's from 2010, but the, the strategies and tactics still make sense. Some of the, I'm sorry, the strategies still make sense. Some of the tactics are outdated, but it was very opinionated about, look, you don't have to start, you know, raise venture capital. Like, here are the steps that I've done. Here are the examples I've done. Here are the people I know that are doing this. And, and it was this view into this subculture that, you know, is more prominent today, but it was, it, you know, still isn't, isn't super widely known. And so that, I just kept stacking these things on each other, right? It was like the blog and RSS subscribers to the email list, to the, the, the book, and then podcast startups for the rest of us launched in 2010 and then kind of pushed all the way, you know, the weight behind that to get the conference going. And as I said, it was each step was hard, right? It was hard work every time. Like starting that email list with zero people was agonizing, you know, and <laughs> trying to launch a conference, even with the audience we had was, was really tough. But then at a certain point, something I've realized is like your audience, as long as you keep the same interest and kind of the same flow, like, your audience moves with you from product to product. The odds of, you know, you're listening to this podcast here. You're, you're going to have, you know, hopefully you know, 5, 10, 20 different jobs, products, interesting things you do in your life. Not many things follow you f all through that, that whole line. But I've seen my audience follow me all the way from .NET Invoice through everything I just said, you know, blog, email, podcast, conference, and now... And then to my next, you know, SaaS app, which I, I, you know, we'll get to at some point is it was drip. And then I'm now starting an accelerator for bootstrappers called tiny seed. And my audience has followed me there. And I don't, I couldn't launch tiny seed if I didn't have the trust and the reputation and, you know, the, the influence that I've built up over, over 13 years of talking about it. Conclusion wise, like if I would have to uh, conclude, let's say what you're saying is, to the audience is if you want to start anything in public, like train it in private in the sense that you build a relationship with your audience way before that you want to start this. Yeah. And I don't, I want to be careful here because I don't want to sound like that's the only way. That's the way I've done it. And I've found it very, it's the way I would recommend doing it. However, I have a bunch of friends who don't want to do the personal brand thing. They don't want to do the in public thing. And they did just start, you know, a SaaS app or a business or a company. You can totally do that um, and not do, every, do everything I just said, right? Maybe you just don't have the interest to be a, a public figure and you don't want the influence and you don't need it. That's totally cool. But if you're going to, um, I, I think that the interesting thing with those folks, they build great businesses. If they sell their business or if it gets shut down or if it goes under, they don't have, they have experience still, but they don't have much else to bring with them to the next one, if that yes. makes sense. And so those are the folks who I hear who sell a business. You know, if you read um, like Built to Sell or you read Finish Big, um, a lot of those folks, they, they build up and some of them are contract, you know, electrical contractors or whatever. It's not just software stuff, but they've put their whole life into their business. And once they sell it, they're like, I don't know what to do next. You know, and, and there's this huge gap in their life. I never felt that. Like I sold Drip in 2016 and people were like, well, what are you going to do next? And I was like, I, I, I have two podcasts. I have, a, I have my blog still. I have an email list. I have three conferences that I run. Like, what am I going to do next? I don't know. Probably take some time off, you know, but then um, I'll find something to do next. And it's probably going to be based around the audience, you know? So that's, that's been my through line. And I think it's been a pretty good guiding 
like a guiding principle for me that's been helpful. One thing that I've, I've really noticed and learned as uh, growing my tribe and talking to other tribe builders, community builders, and influencers is um, a few things. One, um, there are a lot of entrepreneurs and it's completely okay that want to st- kind of not stay under the radar, but not create a personal brand and to continue to not have that personal image, which is fine. However, one major advantage I've learned about this is somebody said this the other day at dinner that it's uh, creating a personal brand is an insurance policy. And it makes sense because if you have that tribe in that community, no matter what happens to your business, uh, if you lose it all or uh, if you have hard times or great times um, and you shift, you still have the the followers that are going to follow you almost no matter what, right? And they're going to want to hear what you say depending on that shift and they're, they're almost going to want to follow you through that shift. So it's kind of a in, in a way, a backup plan. So for you, for example, Rob, or any of us, like if you lost everything today, you would still have this following of people that you could reestablish a business with, create a new conference with, create a new software business with that would be uh, supporters of that. And that, that blows my mind. And the other thing too, is that even if we're not building a personal brand, we still have a personal brand. Your personal brand is just the brand of you not having a personal brand. And so those entrepreneurs that kind of hang under the radar, they're still getting that image and that brand in some, some sort of faction faction. Would you agree? That makes sense. Cool. Yeah. You know, I, I did a, uh, I believe I wrote a blog post about this, but I did a talk that I called the four unfair advantages when starting, when bootstrapping a SaaS, a software as a service. And I, I believe this applies to most things. And I, I looked at all these companies that had done really well and taken off quickly, like a bare metrics or a drip uh, or, a, or a balsamic, if you're familiar with any of those. And there are only four. I couldn't find any more. Like I did this analysis and the four are who you know. So is your network, who knows you, your audience. Um, what was the third? Oh, the third one was being early. Like if you're the first one to a space like bare metrics was with Stripe analytics. And uh, the fourth one was like hardcore growth hacking skills, like Noah Kagan, you know, level growth hacking mm-hmm. skills. Now the interesting thing is being early is, is a gamble and it's only something you can do. You're probably going to do it once in your life. It's going to be tough to be early to a lot of spaces, but your network and, and your audience and those two things are different. You know, some people don't realize you could, you could not build a personal brand, meaning not build an audience, but if you build a really strong network, like a private network of people that know you and you know, you know, and there are people in the DC like this, right? Where if I say the name Travis Jamison, people in the DC know who knows who he is, right? He has a good yeah. network. But if you talk about him publicly on the podcast, um, he's not out there doing personal brand stuff, but he still has a reputation. So I think that is something that Ru- Ruben Gomez of BidSketch, um, which is proposal software. He's the same way. He has this incredible network behind the scenes and can talk to kind of anybody at any time and get favors, but he, he doesn't blog. He doesn't podcast. He just is doing things behind the scenes. So I do think that there's, um, there are different ways to do it, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Good point. Noah, what's your thoughts? Any questions? I was, I made that mistake. <laughs> That's why I raised my hand and say guilty. Uh, I think if you are if you are an entrepreneur, like these days, it's crucial and a must to build your brand. Uh, and even even if it's within a specific uh, small tribe of friends or group of people, uh, build your brands and and make yourself appearable to to that to that tribe. Because uh, uh, as as uh, as many people said. If anything happened, if tomorrow you go bankrupt, like if I tomorrow go bankrupt, I have at least 30, 40 people that where I can uh, borrow money, uh, l- lend money from to do a project, to do real estate or to start a company. And, and that will never happen if I don't have that, uh, that connection. Because at the end of the day, an entrepreneur, the business of an entrepreneur is, is, uh, is building a trust. At the end of the day, people do business with you because because they trust you. So, and by building that brand, you show actually who you are. And I started way too late with that. So, yeah, I totally agree. Yep, it's about building relationships. Is how I think about it.
you know, and, and some, your audience may be more of a one way relationship, you know, where you don't know them, but they do feel like they know you and you know, you have a relationship with them and then your network, of course, is more of a, you know, a two way relationship. How do you feel that the, the conference, both the conference and the podcast have helped you uh, grow those relationships? Yeah. Well, I mean the, the podcast, you know, growing from, I think the first several, you know, we emailed our list and promoted the whole thing and, and first episodes had like 500 listeners, you know, which was after we had blogging to 25,000 people every post that felt kind of devastating and over, but we've done it weekly, you know, for 420 episodes. So we still do it. It's eight years later. Um, that being in people's earbuds, I realized the difference early on, how different it is for people to hear you rather than read your thoughts on paper um, or on, on a screen. Because I was, again, I was blogging. I have 350 or 400 blog posts, like really, a lot of them are really in-depth things, took me 15 hours to write. I mean, I was, there's multiple books, you know, on my blog. So it was hundreds, if not thousands of hours over the course of uh, six, seven years when I was really hammering it. And I had all these followers and at one point I surveyed them and said, hey, what, what do you like most about the blog or blah, blah, blah. And I got a bunch of replies that said, you know, I know that you write cool stuff, but I, I'm having trouble what you wrote versus what I just clicked through on Hacker News because I clicked through a bunch of stuff from Dig and Hacker News and uh, social media and I'm just having trouble differentiating your smart thoughts from other people's, you know, smart or, or unintelligent, whatever, other people's content. And it kind of <laughs> hit me like, wow, the internet has become a little bit commoditized, you know, where I, I'm writing these essays and I feel like I'm being really opinionated and people were commenting and, and tweeting and all that stuff, but then they wouldn't remember the next time. Like, who is this person? And so to me, the podcast was the next level because now they hear a voice and they identify more with the personality and they identify more with you as a human being. And so that really deepened, you know, to your, back to your question of how, how did these things deepen those relationships? Um, the, the blog was just the next level as far as I'm concerned. And then public speaking was the next level, you know, get out I'm in front of, I, you know, I spoke 10 times uh, back in whatever, 2012, 2011 timeframe and kind of ramped up speaking. I don't do much anymore because it's just, it's, I don't love the travel, but um, that was another way when you get in a room with people and it's like, oh, this, this deepens that relationship. You see a lot of products. You you see a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, imagine, let's say, I just got a bonus, you know, from a company, and I'm I decided to stop working. And uh, I'm intelligent. I can work in processes, and I'm internet savvy. Like I always say, you can better like job hop on a trend instead of creating a trend. Um, what, where, imagine I have money and I want to invest it and I want to invest my time also in it. Uh, and I'm a listener to, to, to this podcast. What, where would I go? What, what should I start and how, how can I use, let's say the, the microconf to, uh, to start? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I think you have to ask, you'd have to ask yourself, you know, are you willing to, to acquire a business that exists already? with your money or, or do you feel the need to kind of do it from scratch? That'd be the first question I would answer. Cause there are some people who just have no desire, even though I think it gets you there faster. I think it's easier. I think it reduces risk to acquire. There are people who just ne have no desire and never want to. So that'd be the first thing. And if you're willing to acquire, then I'd say um, that's where you get connected with folks who are, who are in the space. You know, there's flippa.com is kind of a crappy website for it, but they do have some, some deals, also some scams. And then you look at the three main brokers, right, in our space, which is yeah. FE International and Empire Flippers and yes. um, Quiet Light. And then, yeah, I mean, you can come to MicroConf, you know, FE comes every year and Empire Flippers came to MicroConf this year. And that's where you just, you know, start building those relationships. Um, if you want to build, that's where you you really need, I think you need a lot of support to do that. I think it's a harder road, um, but obviously you can do it, with, you know, it's if you have more time than money at that point. Um, and that's where I would get involved in some community. I mean, you look at the communities around us. It depends on what you want to build. You know, if it's software related, then you're going to look at indie hackers, right? Or you're going to look at Founder Cafe, my community. Or, you know, if you want to do something in person, you do come to MicroConf. And if you're more, you know, I don't know, info product or you want to do e-commerce, like 
the, the DC is a great place to do that dynamite circle tropical NBA podcast. Um, and there's, you know, in betweens, if you want to buy and sell websites, you look at rhodium rhodium weekend, you know, which is a, both a podcast and uh, other things. So I, years ago, I believed I could do this stuff all on my own. I had this notion that I could be this solo developer and I didn't need a network. I didn't need relationships. And that was just tur- has been turned on its head over and over for me over the past 10 years. And so I think if you're listening and you're not involved in some kind of community, it doesn't even need to be a paid community. It doesn't have to be a conference, although the value of conferences to me now are just off the charts. I go to more conferences now than I used to because I just realized getting face-to-face time with people is is so unique in this world of, you know, social media and, and bits and bytes. Yeah. I, I'd like to thank you too, Rob. I really appreciate your time and trips uh, and tips and tricks and all your wisdom that you shared with us. If the listeners want to reach out and learn more about what you guys have going on, where's the best place they could do that at? Yeah, probably robwalling.com. That's, I have an email list there and that is where I let people know, Hey, I'm launching this new thing or I'm, you know, thinking about this kind of stuff. Awesome. Rob, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. And listeners, thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Hey, listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our five, six, seven, and eight-figure private masterminds. These are all designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to help you scale rapidly and grow. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That's thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you all on the next episode.